This is chapter 14, uh, read over again because it sucked. I believe it's 14 that sucked. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Chapter 14. Justice. Rusanov had expected Kappa's visit to cheer him up, but the news she brought sickened him so much that it would really have been better if she didn't come at all. As he went up the stairs, he reeled and clung to the banister, a chill fever sweeping over him with growing power. Kappa was not allowed to go upstairs with him in her coat and outdoor shoes. A lazy orderly was standing there especially to prevent it. So Kappa made her take Pavel Nikolaevich to the ward and carry the bag of provisions. The nurse on duty was lobster-eyed Zoya, who for some reason had caught Rusanov's fancy that first evening. There she was, sitting at her table, fenced off by a pile of registers, flirting with the uncouth bone chewer and paying scant attention to the patients. Rusanov asked her for an aspirin, to which she answered glibly that aspirins were given out only in the evening. Still, she took his temperature and brought him something later. The provisions had been changed in his bedside table, but he'd taken no part in it. He laid down as he longed to do, his tumor against the pillow. It was surprising that the pillows here were soft. He hadn't even had to bring one from home. He pulled the blankets over his head. The thoughts in his brain were tumbling and jostling, burning him so violently that the rest of his body had lost all sense of feeling. It was as though he were drugged. He could no longer hear the insane conversations going on in the room. And although both he and the floorboards were shuddering from Yefram's pacing, he was insensible to do that as well. He didn't notice that the day had brightened. It was just before sunset, and somewhere the sun was creeping through, only not on their side of the building. He didn't notice the hours slipping by either, he kept falling asleep, perhaps because of the medicine he'd just taken, and then waking up again. Once, he woke up and the electric light was already on. He went to sleep again. When he woke next, it was the middle of the night, and the place was dark and silent. He felt that sleep had vanished forever. Its beneficent veil had slipped away from him, but terror, in full measure, clamped on to the middle of his chest and held it in a vice. A host of ideas, gradually unraveling themselves, crowded in Rusonov's head, in the room and all around in the spacious darkness. They weren't ideas at all, really. It was just that he was terrified. He was terrified that tomorrow morning, Rodashev would suddenly force his way past the nurses, past the orderlies, fling himself into the room and start beating him. He was not afraid of being brought to justice or of the judgment of society or of disgrace, but simply being beaten up. It had happened only once before in his life, at school, in the sixth class, during his last year. They'd waited for him one evening, by the gate, ready to get him. None of them had knives, but ever since then, he had a terrible apprehension of cruel, bony fists coming at him from all directions. When someone dies, whom we haven't seen for years, we continue to see him after his death as the young man he was at our last meeting, even though he must, in the years between, have grown old. Radishev had been away 18 years and would probably be an invalid by now. Deaf, perhaps, or 
all crippled and bent. But Rasanov still saw him as the suntanned, healthy he-man he had once been, standing on their joint balcony with his dumbbells and weights that last Sunday before he was arrested. With Kappa's help, Rasanov had already written a letter, taken it to the proper authorities, and handed it in. Stripped to the waist, Rodoshev had called to Rasanov, Pashka, come here, feel my biceps, don't be shy, press. Now you see what our new style engineers are made of. We're not a lot of ricket-ridden namby-pambies like that German Eduard Kristoforovich. We're well-coordinated men. Look at you. You become such a weakling, you'll wither away behind the leather door of yours. Come down to the factory, and I'll get you a job at the shop floor. Eh? What about it? Don't you want to? Ha, ha, ha. He burst out laughing and went off to wash, singing, Blacksmiths are we, with hearts young and free. It was this great hunk of a man that Rasonov imagined was about to charge into the ward, fists flailing. It was a false picture, but he could not rid himself of it. He and Rodoshev had once been friends. They'd been in the same young communist cell and had both been awarded this apartment by the factory. Afterward, Rodoshev had gone to workers' high school and later to college, while Rusanov had gone into trade union work and personnel records administration. Then disagreements began, first of all, between their wives, then between the men themselves. Radishev often adopted a very insulting way of talking to Rasanov, generally behaving too independently and setting himself up against public opinion. Living shoulder to shoulder with them became cramped and intolerable. Well, one thing led to another. They had been hasty, of course, and Pavel Nikolaevich wrote the letter. He said they'd have a private conversation in which Rodoshev had spoken up in favor of the activities of the recently liquidated industrial party and intended to get a group of saboteurs together at the factory. The one thing Rasanov most particularly requested was that his name should be kept out of the proceedings and that there should be no confrontation. The very idea of such a meeting terrified him. The interrogator had guaranteed that the law would not require Rusonov's name to be mentioned, and that a confrontation was not obligatory. It would be sufficient for the accused himself to confess. It would not even be necessary for Rusonov's original letter to be included in the file on the case, so that the accused would not come across his neighbor's name when he signed Article 206. It would all have gone quite smoothly if it had not been for Guzin who was secretary of the factory's party committee. He received a note from the security authorities to the effect that Rodoshev was an enemy of the people and must be expelled from the factory party cell. However, he dug his toes in and started to make a fuss, saying that Rodoshev was our boy, and could he, Guzin, please be given details of the evidence? The fuss he made rebounded on his own head. Two days later, he too was arrested during the night. On the third morning, both Rodoshev and Guzin were duly expelled as members of the same counter-revolutionary underground organization. What put Rizanov on the spot now was the fact that during the two days when they were trying to talk Guzin round, they had been forced to tell him it was Rizanov who had provided the evidence. This meant that if Guzin had met Rodoshev out there, and since they were involved in the same case, it was quite possible they had met, he'd have told him everything. This was why Rusanov was now worried about the man's ominous return and about this inconceivable resurrection from the dead. Possibly, too, Rodoshev's wife had guessed the truth, was she alive, though? Kappa's plan had been to wait till Rodoshev 
was arrested and then have Katka Rodeshiva evicted and take over the entire apartment. The whole terrace would then be theirs. Looking back, it now seemed quite ludicrous that they should have regarded a 14 square meter room in a flat without gas as so important. But they did. The children were growing up. The operation was all agreed and ready. But when they came to evict Katka, she pulled a fast one on them. She claimed she was pregnant. They insisted on a checkup, and she produced a certificate. Perfect. As if she had foreseen it all. It is illegal to evict a pregnant woman. So, it was only the following winter that they managed to get her out. And for so many long months, they had to put up with her, living side by side with her while she carried the child and bore it and afterwards, right to the end of her maternity leave. Of course, Kappa kept her well down in the kitchen, and Ava, who was four years old by this time, was very funny the way she teased her and spat in her saucepans. What about Rasanov's fear? He lay on his back in the darkness of the gently breathing, gently snoring ward. Only a faint gleam from the nurse's table lamp in the lobby penetrated the frosted glass of the door. His mind was clear and sleepless as he wondered why the shades of Rodashev and Guzin had rattled him so much. Would he be frightened if other people came back whose guilt he had also helped to establish? That man, Edward Kristofurovich, for instance, whom Rodashev had happened to mention on the terrace, he was an engineer with a bourgeois upbringing who had called Pavel a fool and a rogue in front of the workers. Later he confessed that his one dream was the restoration of capitalism. And that stenographer who had been found guilty of distorting the speech of a certain important official, Pavel Nikolaevich's patron, who had, in fact, used quite different words in his address. And that pig-headed accountant. What's more, it emerged that his father was a priest. It only took them a minute to pin him down after that. Yelchansky and his wife, too. And what of the others? Pavel Nikolaevich was not afraid of any of them. He had helped to establish the guilt of them all, more boldly and openly as time went on. On two occasions, he had even gone to the confrontation, raised his voice, and denounced them. At that time, it was not considered in the least shameful to do such a thing. In that excellent and honorable time, the years 1937 and 1938, the social atmosphere was noticeably cleansed, and it became easier to breathe. The liars and slanderers those who had been too bold in their criticism, the clever dick intellectuals, all of them disappeared, shut up, or lay low, while the men of principle, the loyal and stable men, Rusonov's friends and Rusonov himself, were able to walk with dignity, their heads held high. Now times had changed. Things were bewildering, unhealthy. The finest civic actions of earlier days were now shameful. Would he now have to fear for his own skin? Fear? What nonsense! Looking back over his whole life, Rusanov could not find a single instance of cowardice to reproach himself with. Indeed, had there been anything for him to be afraid of. As a man, he was not particularly brave, perhaps, but he could not call to mind an occasion when he had behaved like a coward. There was no ground whatever for suggesting he'd have been afraid if he had to fight in the front line. It was simply that he'd been a valuable, experienced official, and so had not been sent to the front. It was impossible to say he'd have lost his head under bombing or in a burning building. He'd left K- before the bombing started, and he'd never been in a fire. Likewise, he had never been afraid of justice or the law, because he had never broken the law, and justice had always defended and supported him. 
He had never feared public exposure because the public also had always been on his side. An improper article attacking Rasanov would never have appeared in the local newspaper because either Kuzma Fultievich or Nil Prokovich would have stopped it, while a national newspaper would never have stooped to Rasanov's level. So he had never been afraid of the press either. When he traveled by boat across the Black Sea, he was not the least bit afraid of the depths beneath him. Whether or not he was afraid of heights, it was impossible to say, because he had never been such a fathead as to try climbing rocks or mountains, while the nature of his work did not involve bridge building. The nature of Rasanov's work had been for many years, by now almost 20, that of personnel records administration. It was a job that went by different names in different institutions, but the substance of it was always the same. Only ignoramuses and uninformed outsiders were unaware what subtle, meticulous work it was, what talent it required. It was a form of poetry, not yet mastered by the poets themselves. As every man goes through life, he fills in a number of forms for the record, each containing a number of questions. A man's answer to one question on one form becomes a little thread permanently connecting him to the local center of personnel records administration. There are thus hundreds of little threads radiating from every man, millions of threads in all. If these threads were suddenly to become visible, the whole sky would look like a spider's web, and if they materialized as rubber bands, buses, trams, and even people would all lose the ability to move, and the wind would be unable to carry torn up newspaper or autumn leaves along the streets of the city. They are not visible, they are not material, but every man is constantly aware of their existence. The point is that a so-called completely clean record was almost unattainable, an ideal, like absolute truth. Something negative or suspicious can always be noted down against any man alive. Everyone is guilty of something, or has something to conceal. All one has to do is to look hard enough to find out what it is. Each man permanently aware of his own invisible threads naturally develops a respect for the people who manipulate the threads, who manage the personnel records administration, that most complicated science, and for these people's authority. To use yet another analogy, this time a musical one, Brasanov's special position put a set of xylophone keys at his disposal. By choice, desire, or necessity, he might strike any one of them. Although they were all made of wood, each gave out a different note. There were keys, that is to say, devices, that could be used with gentle precision. For example, if he wished to let a comrade know he was dissatisfied with him, or simply to give him a warning, or put him in his place, Rusanov knew well how to say, good morning in different tonalities. When the other man said good morning to him, he had to do it first, of course. Rasanov might reply in a cold, business-like tone without a smile. Or he might draw his eyebrows together. He would rehearse this in front of the mirror in his office and be a little slow about replying, as if he was in doubt as to whether he ought to say good morning to this particular person, whether he was worthy of it. Only then would he say good morning, turning his head toward the man either completely, or only halfway, or even not at all. The small pause, however, always had considerable effect. Every member of the staff who was greeted with this hesitation or coolness would begin to rack his brain for all the sins he might be guilty of. The seed of doubt once sown, the man might well refrain from some false step which he was on the point of taking. 
but which Pavel Nikolaevich would have only learned about later. There was another stronger method he sometimes used. He would meet a man, or else call him up, or have him specially fetched, and say, Will you please come and see me at ten o'clock tomorrow morning? Can't I come now? The man would always ask, anxious to find out why he was being summoned, and to get the interview over. No, you can't come now, Rusanov would say, blandly, but severely. He wouldn't say that he had other business, or was on his way to a conference. Not for anything in the world would he give a simple, straightforward reason that might set the man's mind at rest. This was the whole point of the device. He would pronounce the words, You can't come now, as though they were fraught with various meanings, not all of them favorable. What's it about? The man would ask, either through nerve or sheer lack of experience. You will find out tomorrow. The velvet voice of Pavel Nikolaevich would evade the tactless question. But from then until 10 o'clock tomorrow was a long time. So many things could happen in between. The man had to finish his day's work, travel home, talk to his family, perhaps go to the movies or to a parent's meeting at his children's school, and finally get to sleep. Some did, some didn't, and then choked down his breakfast the next morning, while all the time the question was drilling and gnawing at him. Why does he want to see me? The long hours would give the man plenty of time for remorse and general misgiving, and he would no doubt vow, never again, to cross his boss at meetings. When ten o'clock finally came, it might turn out that nothing more was wanted than to check his date of birth, or the number on his diploma. Like xylophone keys, these devices would mount the wooden scale until they came to the driest and shrillest note of all. Sergei Sergeyevich, the director of the whole enterprise, the local boss. Would you like to fill out this form by such and such? A date? Rusanov would hand the man a form, but this was no ordinary form. It was the most detailed and unpleasant of all the forms and questionnaires kept in Rusanov's cabinet. For example, it was the one that had to be filled out before a man was given access to secret files. There might be no question of the man having access to secrets, and Sergei Sergeyevich might not know anything about it all. But who was going to check up when everyone went in mortal fear of Sergei Sergeyevich? The man would take the form and try to put on a bold front, but the fact was that if there was anything he had ever concealed from the record center, his insides would be churning. With this questionnaire, it was impossible to conceal anything. It was an excellent questionnaire, the best of the whole lot. With its help, Rusanov had succeeded in making several women divorce their husbands who were imprisoned under Article 58. Article 58 being the main political article of the penal code in force at the time. However cleverly the women hid their tracks, sent off their parcels under different names and from different towns, or even sent no parcels at all, the net of questions woven by this form was so fine that further lying became impossible. The only possible way through was for the women to be finally and legally divorced. There was a specially simplified procedure for such cases. The court did not have to ask the prisoner's agreement to the divorce, or inform him that the divorce had been concluded. Rusanov was keenly concerned that such divorcees should take place, that the criminal's dirty paws should not drag a woman not yet lost from society's collective path. But the questionnaires were never used and were only shown to Sergei Sergeyevich by way of a joke. The poetic side of his work lay in holding a man in the hollow of your hand without even starting to pile on the pressure. Rasanov's mysterious, isolated, almost supernatural position 
in the general production system gave him a satisfyingly deep knowledge of the true processes of life. The life familiar to everybody, work, conferences, factory news sheets, local trade union announcements pinned up at the checkpoint, applications for various benefits, the cafeteria and the factory club, was not real. It only seemed so to the uninitiated. The actual direction life took was decided without loud publicity, calmly, in quiet offices, by two or three people who understood one another, or by dulcet telephone calls. The stream of real life ran on in secret papers that lay deep in the briefcases of Rasanov and his colleagues. For years, this life might follow a man in silence, then suddenly, and momentarily, it would reveal itself, breathing fire from its jaws as it rose from its underground kingdom, wrenching off a victim's head or belching fire over him, then disappearing, no one, nowhere. Afterward, everything reimagined, the same on the surface, club, cafeteria, applications for benefits, news sheets, work. Yet, as the workers walked past the factory checkpoint, one man would be missing, dismissed, removed, or eliminated. Brasanov's office was equipped in a manner suited to the poetic and political nature of the subtle work he performed. It had always been a secluded room. In the early years, it had a door upholstered with leather and studded with shiny wallpaper nails. But later on, as society became richer, it was further furnished with a sort of safety device in the doorway, a dark little cubicle, like a lobby. This lobby seemed a perfectly simple invention with nothing particularly cunning about it. It was no more than three feet across and the caller spent only a second or two in it, between closing the first door and opening the second. But to a man facing a critical interview, those few seconds seemed almost like a brief spell in prison. There was no light and no air, and he felt the full weight of his nothingness compared with the importance of the man whose office he was about to enter. If he had any bold or self-assertive ideas, he would forget about them, right there, in the lobby. Naturally enough, groups were never allowed to burst into Pavel Nikolaevich's office. People were allowed only in, one by one, after being summoned or given permission to come over the telephone. This arrangement and admission routine greatly encouraged a properly considered and regulated execution of all duties in Rasanov's department. Without the precautionary lobby, Pavel Nikolaevich would have suffered. Of course, a dialectic independence of all facets of reality dictated that Pavel Nikolaevich's behavior at work inevitably had an effect on his way of life in general. Asterisk next to reality. This is a takeoff of pseudo-Marxist, Stalinist, jargon. Gradually with the years, he and Kapitolina Madvayevna developed an aversion to teeming human beings to jostling crowds. The Rasanovs found streetcars, buses, and trolley buses quite disgusting. People were always pushing, especially when they were trying to get aboard. Insults were always flying around. Builders and other workers were always climbing in in dirty overalls, and you could get oil or lime all over your coat. The worst thing was their inveterate habit of clapping you familiarly on the shoulder and asking you to pass a ticket or some change along the car. It meant you were at their beck and call, endlessly passing things on. The distances were too great for going about the town on foot, and anyway, it was a bit vulgar, hardly right for a man in his position. Besides, you could always come up against something unexpected among pedestrians. So the Rasanovs gradually changed over to motor cars, first office limousines and taxis, and then their own. They found it quite unbearable, of course, to travel in ordinary 
railway carriages, or even in reserved seats, where people crammed in, wearing sheepskin coats and carrying buckets and sacks. The Rasanovs now traveled only in reserved compartments, or soft class. Naturally, when he stayed in a hotel, he always had a room reserved for him. There was never any danger of finding himself in a communal room. Naturally, too, they did not go to just any rest home, but only to the places where they knew and respected you, and where it was arranged for the beach and the walks to be fenced off from the general public. And when the doctors told Kapitolina Matvayevna she ought to walk more, she positively had nowhere to walk except inside a rest home like this, among her equals. The Rasanovs loved the people. They are great people. They served the people and were ready to give their lives for the people. But as the years went by, they found themselves less and less able to tolerate actual human beings, those obstinate creatures who were always resistant, refusing to do what they were told, and besides, demanding something for themselves. So they became wary of people who were badly dressed, impudent, or even a bit drunk. You came across people like that in suburban trains, at beer kiosks, at bus and railway stations. A badly dressed man was always dangerous because it meant he lacked a proper sense of responsibility. He'd also probably be a man with little to lose, otherwise he'd be decently dressed. Of course, the police and the law were there to protect Rosanov against badly dressed men. Only this protection would inevitably arrive too late. It would punish the criminal after the event, up against him on his own. Pavel Nikolaevich was in fact defenseless. Neither his position nor his past services could in any way protect him. The lout might insult him for no reason, hurl obscenities at him, bash his face in just for the fun of it, spoil his suit or even take it away by force. So, although there was nothing in the world Rusanov feared, he did begin to feel a totally normal, justifiable fear of dissolute, half-drunk men, or, to be more precise, of a fist striking him a direct blow in the face. This was why the news of Rodoshev's return had upset him so much at first. Rasanov imagined that the first thing Rodoshev would do would be to punch him in the face. He was not afraid of Rodoshev or Guzin taking legal action. Legally, they could probably never get at him. There was nothing they could or should have against him. But what if they were still big, strong, healthy men who might take into their heads, vulgarly speaking, to poke him in the snout? As a new man, intelligent and resolute, Pavel Nikolaevich had to overcome and stifle this fear. Well, for a start, it might all be pure imagination, and anyway, Rodoshev might not even exist anymore. God forbid he should ever return. All these stories about people returning might be mere inventions. Pavel Nikolaevich was in constant touch with important events, yet, so far, he had no foreboding that life might assume a new character. In the second place, even if Rodoshev had come back, he wouldn't come here. He'd have gone to K Dash. Besides, he'd have other things to do than go looking for Rasanov. He'd have to watch his step so as not to be thrown out of K Dash yet again. Pavel Nikolaevich's first involuntary fright had been quite unnecessary after all. And even if he did start looking, it would take him some time to pick up the trail leading here. The train journey took three days across eight provinces, and even when he arrived, he'd go first to Rasanov's home rather than the hospital. Pavel Nikolaevich felt he was quite safe so long as he was 
in the hospital. Safe. That's a joke. A tumor like this and you call it safe. Anyway, with a time of such uncertainty ahead, a man might as well die. Better to die than to let them come back. Better to die than live in fear of every man who returned. What madness it was to let them come back. Why did they do it? They'd grown used to being where they were. They were resigned to it. Why let them come back here and upset people's lives? It looked by now as if Pavel Nikolaevich had, at last, burned himself out and was ready for sleep. He really ought to try and get some sleep. But he needed to go down the corridor. This was the most unpleasant procedure in the clinic. Moving his body very carefully, he turned over. The tumor was squatting on his neck, pressing against him like an iron fist. He clambered out of the bed with its sagging mattress, put on his pajamas, slippers, and spectacles, and set off, shuffling quietly across the room. Alert at her table, Maria, severe and swarthy, turned watchfully toward him as he shuffled along. At the top of the staircase, a hefty, long-armed, long-legged Greek, newly arrived, was writhing and groaning in agony on his bed. He couldn't lie down. He was sitting up as if the bed were too small for him. He followed Pavel Nikolaevich with his sleepless, horror-stricken eyes. On the middle landing, a small yellow-looking man, his hair still neatly brushed, was half sitting in his bed, propped up by two extra pillows and breathing oxygen out of what looked like a waterproof canvas container. On his bedside table, he had oranges, cakes, Turkish delight, and a bottle of yogurt. He was quite indifferent to them all. He couldn't get enough clean, ordinary air, which cost absolutely nothing, into his lungs. In the lower corridor, there were more beds with patients in them. Some of them were asleep. An oriental-looking woman with a disheveled mane of hair was sprawled across her pillow in agony. Next, he walked past a small room where all those due for enemas, whoever they might be, were placed on the same short, none-too-clean couch. Finally, drawing in his last breath and doing his best to hold it, Pavel Nikolaevich entered the laboratory. It was a laboratory without cubicles or even proper pedestals, and it made him feel especially vulnerable and humbled in the dust. The orderlies cleaned the place up several times every day, but they never managed to keep pace with it. There were always fresh signs of vomit, blood, or other filth. Of course, the laboratory was used by savages, unaccustomed to life's comforts, and by patients who were on their last legs. He would have to go to the senior doctor and get permission to use the doctor's laboratory. But Pavel Nikolaevich's heart was only half in this highly practical plan. He set off again, past the enema room, past the disheveled Kazakh woman and the patients sleeping in the corridor, then past the condemned man with the oxygen bag. On the top landing, the Greek wheezed at him in a ghastly whisper. Hey, brother, listen. Do they cure everyone here? Or do some die? Rasonov looked around at him wildly, and the gesture brought him up sharp. He realized that he could no longer turn his head by itself. His whole body, like Ephraim's, had turned with it. The terrible thing stuck to his neck, was pressing up against his chin and down onto his collarbone. He hurried back to his own bed. How could he think of anything else? How could he be afraid of anyone else? Who could he rely on? His fate lay there, between his chin and his collarbone. Their justice was being done. And in answer to this justice, he could summon no influential friend, no past services, no defense. 